was a moment in my life that changed absolutely everything. It was about 3.10 p.m. on January 15, 2013. We were in room four on the second level of the Via Christi St. Teresa Hospital in Wichita, Kansas. And I was holding my baby girl, Chloe, for the very first time. It was not just the first time I was holding her, it was the first time I, was, I had ever held a baby. I was so afraid when I was younger that I was going to drop a baby, that I never held a baby. So they handed me this, this minute-old baby, and they're like, don't drop this baby. I held her in my hands, and the room was chaotic. There, there was nurses, there was doctors, there was technicians, they were cleaning, they were organizing, they were checking levels, they were doing all these things. But for me, time stood still. And I know you know that moment when you're holding your baby for the first time. You look to her and you're like, I will murder anyone, anytime, to protect you, right? You look, I looked at this baby and I thought, I love you so ferociously. And I, I, this is the first time I've met you. Made so many promises that, that, that afternoon, right? Promised to love the baby, love the, the, promised to protect them, to listen to them, to point them to Jesus. As I held that baby, there was one thought that kind of consistently ran through my mind, though. And it's kind of run through my mind ever since. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have never held a baby before. And they said, here's this baby. Take it home and, and, and raise it by yourself. And we're sitting there and we're like, no, but are there more videos to watch? Are there more classes to go through? I don't know what I'm doing. The first time she cried at home, it's like, is she dying? I don't know. I've never heard a baby cry. I don't know what to do here. And then in that moment, you think, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. There's seriously days where you look and say, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to survive this. And then they get a little bit older, and they're like two and three, and the terrible twos come along. And there's a renewed interest in this idea. I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how we're going to survive this. And then they get older and older, and this is not personal experience for us because we still have littles, but I worked with teenagers for 10 years. And I know parents are saying, I don't know how we're going to get through this. I don't know how to do this. Right? And then th th there comes the day when they graduate and they're moving off to college and they leave. And you're sitting there thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do this. It feels like every step of the way is, is, a, is a process where you realize, I'm not equipped for this. I don't know, I don't know how my parents did it, but somehow... I survive, and, and somehow we're going to survive through this process. Parenting is a strange journey, isn't it, church? And you're sitting here, you're like, well, I don't have kids at home anymore, so I'm exempt from this sermon series, right, Pastor? I'm glad you asked that. You know. You're sitting on the front row, second row, and you're thinking, I'm a teenager, I don't, I don't, this sermon series is not for me, right? No, and you're wrong. This is for everybody in this church. I know the series is called Parenting on Purpose. But the goal of this series, the goal of this series for everybody in the church to gather together and seek the person of Jesus Christ. I hope that you see that every time I preach. My goal is not to elevate myself, not to make you think, wow, he's studying hard this week. My goal is for you to see Jesus in the words that I say. And so we're going to look through the first three chapters of Proverbs over the next few weeks. And you're going to learn some things about parenting. Everybody wants to give you advice someday. Like, we're, we, we don't know what we're doing, and so we, we take advice from everybody, from people on the radio, from people on TV. Uh, we take advice from, from the internet, we take advice from magazines and all these things. I, I Googled this. This is my skill as a parent. I Googled my parenting tips. But listen, if you Google parenting tips right now, you're going to find 277 million responses. <laughs> if I read one of them every minute, it would take me 192,000 days just to read through. And they're all saying something different. Everybody is telling you how to raise your kids. You'll be in the supermarket and people, random strangers, will offer you advice. You ever get this? Like, well, when, when I was raising kids, that's not how we did that. Like, did I ask? Like, what, where, when did we enter into this conversation where you, where you became a parent? But we're looking for ex experts all over the place. My goal for this series is not to be another voice in the crowd. I don't just want to offer you five tips to be better parents. That's not what this is about. Here's my goal. I'm going to say this every week of this series. I want us to go to the wisest man who has ever lived, Jesus Christ, so he can equip us with the greatest parenting tool available to us today. That's the word of God. 
We, we, can, we can read books. We can read what to expect when you're expecting. We can read books on, 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 on raising the strong-willed child. We can read articles. We can watch videos. We can get advice from people. But if we're not grounded in our parenting or in our grandparenting in the Word of God, then it's all going to be a mess. Here's the truth. Raising godly kids in an ungodly world does not happen by accident. Nobody ever woke up and said, my kids are wise and they have integrity and they're, they're so godly and I didn't do a thing to, to, to make that happen, right? Nobody did that. So, so we invest in our kids now. And grandparents invest. You have, you have a legacy and you have an influence in your grandkids' lives that you, have, you, you don't even realize yet. They listen to you. You know, as a teenager, I never once listened to my parents. Like in that, in that time from 13 to 19. Pretty sure I never heard a single word they said. But you know who I did listen to? My grandma. And she would write me cards for birthdays and different things. And one of the things she always ended her cards with is, Mark, if you, Mark, you should call me Mark. If you don't want to fall, stay out of slippery places. You know, that, that has been like the mantra of my life moving forward. You have an influence on the lives of your, of your grandkids. Moms, we're going to celebrate you today. We want you to feel so welcome here and so loved today. You have an influence like none other, especially when your kids are littles. Man, that you can do no wrong. It, it's like Chloe and I, we love to play. We love to get the bar back. But I want to play the way that I want to play. If I want Ken to be a ninja, he's going to be a ninja. Right? And then all, we all, many from the other little ones here, Dad, stop! That's not how we're supposed to play! And so then it's, it's my fault, obviously. But as we look at this, <laughs> but we're still on this journey of parenthood, right? But moms, you have such a special relationship. When, you're, when your kids get hurt, who are they going to run to? They're going to run to their mom. Now, I would say this. The person that spanked me more than any other growing up was my mom. So I was mildly afraid of her. <laughs> still kind of am. She's a small woman, but I was still kind of, because I know she probably still take me. But we have, we have this influence over this next generation. We have no idea. And, and, and teenagers here, this, this series, I know it's going to be about parenting in your life. This is like 30 years for, for me. And you're not allowed to get married until you're at least 30. Just, just FYI, you're welcome, parents. Okay, so don't, don't, don't even be looking at, at boys, girls that you don't need. Nothing in trouble. What do I say Chloe the other day? Boys are no good, low down, very rock sitters. As we go through this series, I want you guys to know the series is about how your parents care about you. It all it may look like sometimes that you're sitting here thinking, all they want to do is make my life miserable. All they want to do is do make me do things I don't want to do and not let me do the things I want to do. But that's not what they're about. Your parents pray for you, they care about you, they, 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 they pour over you, they invest in you, they purposefully limit themselves and what they get for themselves so that they can get things for you. Okay, I'm going to just give that caveat, and then we're going to jump into the book of Proverbs. We're going to go to the wisest man who ever lived, Jesus Christ, so that he can equip us with the greatest parenting tool we have available to us today, and that's God's Word. Let's talk about the book of Proverbs. Everybody open up. To Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. There's 31 chapters here. You may think that we should start in chapter 31 because that's the, that's the portrait of a godly mother. But I want to start in chapter 1. You can't understand Proverbs 31 without understanding the basics here in Proverbs 1. There's 915 verses in Proverbs. We're going to cover not all of them, right? You're like... I know that he can preach a long time, but he can't cover 915 verses in one week. Don't challenge me, though. The book of Proverbs is organized in such a unique way. It's not like any other book of the Bible. It'd be really tough to, to preach through verse by verse, because I, I like to view it like a, a, a scrapbook made of fortune cookie papers, right? It's just... It's just kind of sprinkled out these different, these different ideas, these different sayings, these different riddles, these different proverbs. And so Warren Wearsby, one of my favorite authors, and he actually went home to be with the Lord last week. But he said this, what Solomon wrote is more like a kaleidoscope than a stained glass window. So for the majority of the book, it's a, it's a tough book to kind of 
kind of walk through verse by verse. It's a really good book, and I'll give this parenting tip, all right? It's a really good book to read one proverb a day if you're thinking. One proverb a day. It's got a lot of insight. Each of your kids will get something different out of it. And there's 31, so you can read one a day. It's a great book to do that. But for the purposes of this study, we're going to look through chapters 1, 2, and 3. They're laid out really well. Solomon is giving kind of his, his purpose for this book. Why am I writing this book? He's writing it to his children so that they would understand and know the Lord. And so that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about here. That the key word, key word in the book of Proverbs is the word wisdom. So if you're following along in your notes, that's the first blank there. The key word is the word wisdom, chokmah. In, in Hebrew, everybody give me a good chokmah. Chokmah, oh, right? You've got to really get a deep in. It means skill in living life. Skill in living life. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? Big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Everybody know that a tomato is a fruit? See here in the Wisdom is knowing not to put it in fruit salad, right? So there's that, there's that big difference between knowing, like, what to do with this thing. So when you would look at an artisan, like, like a person who is a, a knife maker, so a blade seed, the, the way that they that they would they expertly craft this blade, that they pound it out, that, that they get it white hot before putting it into uh, oil to quench it, before they do these things, that kind of skill is what Solomon is talking about. Not in blade making, not in bread making, but in living life. He wants his kids to be successful. He wants his kids to, to live and know how, 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 to, how to navigate the currents of this world. And so he talks about wisdom 125 times. Teenagers, if your parent tells you something 125 times, what do you think that means for you? It's really important. And probably you're not listening if they have to tell you 125 times. And I'm sure that your parents have told you something 125 times. But this is Solomon's purpose, especially in these in chapters, is to, to get his kids to understand what wisdom Hulkman is. Okay, so let's go to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. If you've got it, stand with me, give honor to God's word. Proverbs chapter 1, we're going to start right in verse 1, and we're going to read the first seven verses. Everybody there? All right, let's do this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for learning wisdom and discipline, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving prudent instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity. For teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, or your Bible may say foolish, knowledge and discretion to a young man. Let a wise person listen and increase learning, and let a discerning person obtain guidance. For understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and their riddles. And verse 7, here's the key. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. Why don't we pray? I need to center myself and ground myself and calm down a little bit so I can do this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. It is perfect. It is inerrant. It is irreplaceable in our lives. There is, there is nothing that we can search. No Google search. No, no parenting tips. No magazine cover. Nothing that would compare with the value of your word, both in our lives and in the lives of our I pray that we would take this seriously. I pray that we would realize that the, the training up of the next generation is our responsibility. The world is, is going to pull them in a different direction. And I pray that we would stand firm on the solid rock that we sang about. All of the ground is to stand, but when we stand on Christ the solid rock, and we, when we bring our kids into the fold and we, we show them the value, the eternal soul value, of believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior. I pray that we would raise up the next generation of this church that's stronger than us. I pray that my kids would way surpass me in what they know about you and what they do about you. I pray, Lord, that you would give each of the generations represented in this church a thirst to commit to the principles of you. I thank you so much for what you do for us in Jesus. And I pray today that you guide us in this wisdom. Jesus. So today, I'm 
look at, I want to look at a couple of things, and we're going to be really brief. I know it's 11 o'clock. You're looking at your, your watch and you're like, he hasn't even really started yet. So I have no idea what, we're, what time we're going to get out of here. I promise. I want, I want mothers to be able to go to the restaurant and celebrate with their family. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold you more than like two hours. I think that'll be a good I want us to formulate a game plan. All right. So, Robbie, where are you? Are you back there, man? Yeah, I see you. Okay. So, if I became the, the football coach, worst choice that the Bengals could ever make. But if I became the football coach, and I said to the guys right before the, before the start of the season, guys, I don't really have a plan. I don't, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to go out there and do our best and hope, for the, hope that we're going to win. All right. How successful is my season going to be? <laughs> that was the nicest answer. He said, we're going to struggle. <laughs> okay. We're, we're probably not going to win a game unless we're blessed with some incredible talent. But here's the thing, is that nobody would go into, into a football season thinking, I'm going to go without a game plan. We're just going to do our best. But this is exactly how so many parents and grandparents approach parenting. We look at it and say, I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm just going to pray for the best. Maybe we'll raise godly kids. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll hit a home run. Well, it's not football, but you get me. Right? Maybe, maybe my kids will, will, will be a fantastic kid that just, just knows the Lord and just doesn't make any mistakes. Maybe that's the case. If we don't formulate a game plan early, or right now, wherever we are, then this is going to be an uphill battle. And in the words of Robbie Parrish, we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle. And that's why so many parents do struggle. With this. So I want to help us this morning. Three questions to help us develop a game plan for our household. Whether that's for your kids, your grandkids, or, or as teenagers looking forward in your own life. Number one, I want to ask three questions. Number one is this. What are we aiming at? What are we aiming at? What is your goal with your kids? I know, I know that parenting is tough. I know there's moments when you're like, my goal is just survival. Like for them and me. I just, I just want to make sure that everybody makes it through these next 18 years. Or in the current trends, the next 33, 35 years, right? That you've got kids at home. But look at this. What are we aiming at? I had a professor in the Bible College who said this almost every time he taught us. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. That's what I feel like we're doing. We're aiming at nothing. We're just hoping for the best. But look what Solomon does. Look at verses 2 and 3 of this right here. This is Solomon's purpose. This is what he is aiming at in the lives of his kids. He says, for learning wisdom and discipline, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving prudent instruction and in righteousness, justice and integrity. He is setting the bar so high for his kids. He says, this is who I want you to be. I want you to be wise. Discipline, understanding, insightful, receptive, prudent, righteous, just, and full of integrity. Man, can you imagine if all of us said, that's, that, that's the picture I have of my kids in 20 years. I want them to be men and women of integrity and justice and wisdom. And that, that would absolutely change this world. But listen, listen to me really closely. If this is our goal, apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ, you're raising moralistic. This is, this is what we tend to do in church. We tend to say, you sit down, you listen, you don't open your mouth, you're going you're gonna to listen to Pastor Mark, you're going to do this, you're not going to drink, you're not going to smoke, you're not going to get a tattoo. My dad always told me that if I got a tattoo, I'd be AIDS. So to this day, I'm still very afraid. I think that's why I've developed a fear of needles, because I, I don't know what, what's going on. You know my dad now, so you understand him and his, his ways. But this is the thing, if we don't present them with a reason why we want them to be these things, I don't want, I don't want Chloe to just be wise and, and prudent and insightful and receptive just for the sake of being those things. I want her to be that because Jesus is the perfect picture of those things. Jesus was ultimately wise, perfectly insightful, beautifully receptive. He was a man of integrity. He was a man who kept his word. So when we aim at something in our life, we have goals for our kids, we're not aiming at things or qualities or characteristics. We're aiming at Jesus himself. There is no bar higher that we can set in the person of Jesus Christ. And I know that our kids are not Jesus. I get that. And they're not going to be. There's not one of us in the room that says, I mean, it's like Jesus and my child. We're real close. It's, it's neck and neck. We know it's not. We know we can't be perfect. 
We know our children can't be perfect. Don't put them on, on this pedestal and then make them afraid of failure. But look and say, listen, everywhere we go, every decision we make, every word that we speak, every choice we make, every attitude that we adopt, right, we aim at Jesus. We aim at Him. We aim at Him because one day we'll be with Him for all eternity. Earth is nothing more than practice for heaven. Right where we're looking forward to worshiping the name of the Lord. So what are we aiming for? I understand that when you look at this list, wise, disciplined, understanding, insightful, receptive, prudent, righteous, just, and full of integrity. I understand that is a, that's, a, that's a very high bar to set. Most of us are looking and saying, if my kids don't kill themselves or each other by the end of the day, then I think we'll be okay, right? I think when Mindy went to the Mother's Day brunch yesterday with, with my mother, I watched both girls, okay? And you're like, yeah, you should do that anyway. But you don't understand. Yeah, you don't understand. Every time that Mindy leaves, Sophie screams bloody murder. She knows. Even if she's asleep and Mindy leaves, she wakes up, she's like, Mama's gone. Mama's presence is not in this place. No, but, but she did great yesterday. And I watched all of them. My goal at the end of that day was just survival. That was it. It was just like two hours. Just survive, please. And I came in, and, and she had been sleeping, and she had pulled the stuffed animal off the little shelf, and she put it on her face. I'm like, no! That's the one goal! The one goal! Please, just survive! I just want it to come home, and the house be okay, and then you come in and say, wow, what a, what a great job. I, I got half of that. The house wasn't clean, but the kids survived. Right? That's the goal. But it, listen, in our lives, as we look forward to parenting or grandparenting or having nieces and nephews or raising up to know the Lord, if, if we're doing this apart from Jesus, then we're aiming at the wrong thing. We aim at Jesus, and he says, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and these things, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the first question, if we formulate this game plan, what are we aiming at? What's our goal as we move forward? We want our kids to be successful. You notice these things that he writes, wise, disciplined, understanding, insightful, receptive, prudent, righteous, just, and full of integrity. Those things are not financial things. You hear that? It's not about finance. Those things are not sports things. It's not about that. It's not about success. It's about internal problems. He's saying, above all, I want my kid to stand before the Lord and, and be a man of integrity, be a man of justice, a man who pursued Jesus above all. What are we in at? Number two, where are we at? Where are we at? So where are we aiming at? Here's the flip side, the practical side. Where are we now? Let's look at verses Four through six. It says, for teaching shrewdness to the what? What does your Bible say? Simple. Alright? Somebody say foolish. Somebody have that version. Mine says inexperienced. Okay? So that's part of it. For teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced. Knowledge and discretion to whom? A young, big, a young or a young man. Okay? That's one side. And then five, verse five says, let a wise person. Listen and increase learning, and let a discerning person obtain guidance. Okay, for uh, understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and the riddles. Solomon's given us a scale here. On one end, we have inexperienced young men. On the other end, we have wise and discerning people. Your family is somewhere on that scale. And you're like, as the dad, I know exactly where I am. I'm tipping that scale of the wise and, and discerning section. No, I'm not. Your family is somewhere on that scale. In order for us to get to where we're aiming at, point B, we have to know where we are. Point A. Take some time this week. I'm going to really encourage you. Take some time this week and talk to your family. Where, where are your family? Right? And, and I'm not saying that your five-year-old has to tip the scale of, of wise and discerning. I'm not saying your teenagers have to like be so far on the scale. There's room for growth at all ends. But we need to know where we are. Are your kids safe? Ask them. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you had a time when you ask Jesus in your heart? Those conversations this week might develop into gospel conversations. You might have an opportunity to lead your kids to the Lord. I guarantee you, more people are going to be saved not in the invitation that we lead at the end of service. People are going to be saved in their homes. That's where all these happens. Ninety percent of the people that I've led to the Lord is happening outside of the church. This is your opportunity. I find out where they are. Find out where they are in their faith. Where are we now? We're, we're, so we're going on this journey with our family. We're, we pack the bags. We're figuring out where we're going. We're marking the map. We're, we're gathering everything we need. Now question number three. Look at this with me. Where do we stop? Where 
cartoon star. This seems mind-blowing. How many people in this room have littles, like elementary age kids? <coughs> Show me your hands. Don't be afraid. Okay? How many are raising teenagers right now? Okay, some people, <laughs> you got to mess the whole world, man. You, you, you just got to give me some gifts. How many of you guys are grandparents? Okay? How, many, how about great grandparents? Okay, I'll do it. Great, great grandparents? Okay, no way. So we're a young crowd here. Oh, overall, we're a very young crowd. But listen, we've got, we've got people that, that depend on us, that you're raising up to know the Lord. You know what you want from them. I want them to be like Jesus. You, you may have a good clue of where they are. Maybe they, 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 have, they were saved when they were a kid, and, 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 and now they, they just need to be discipled and grow. So where do we start from here? What do, how, how do I take this practically? Where do I go? Solomon gives us the clue right here. In verse 7, listen to this. Where, where do we start? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to know where to start? You start with the Lord. You start with your relationship with Jesus Christ. You go to Him first. You start, I just, I'm going to step on some toes. Can I step on some toes? Can I do this? Am I allowed to? I'm going to do it. If your kids see that the only thing you care about in your life is sports, it's going to develop in them a pattern where that's the most important thing to them. All right? Being real, I got, I got 150 <laughs> 200 angry faces there. It's okay. It's all right. I'm here for this reason to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's, that's my goal. Okay. But listen, if they see that the proudest moments you have of them is on the ball field, then what is going to happen to their faith? What is going to happen? If the proudest moment that you have of them is when they bring home all A's from school, what do you think is going to happen to their faith? The proudest moments of us as parents and grandparents should be spiritual things. When they come home from youth and they memorize the verse, we applaud that. Cheer them on. When, when they choose, like we had a couple of weeks ago, five kids came forward, or four kids and one adult came forward, and they, they went through the waters of baptism, that should be the moment where we say, I'm so proud of you. I've never been more proud of you than your decision to follow after Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of this journey. That's where we start. But, but we put our eyes on all the wrong things, church. We put our eyes on all the wrong things. We're so proud of you for, for doing this thing. We're so proud of you for this. And then when it comes to church, we sit here and say, well, you should be about done in a couple of minutes. Right? Well, what are we teaching them? But when they see you actively living out your when they see you singing, even if you can't carry a tune, and you know who you are, I hear you. But when they see you singing like that, then it doesn't matter because I worship my Lord. When they see you giving, and it's not like, oh, the pastor's asking for money again. But when they see you giving to the Lord, he's been so faithful to you. When they see you serving, how many of y'all serve in, in our kids or our teen ministry? How many of you guys serve? As Sunday school teachers or, or leaders or something like that. There's a lot of hands. They were afraid to raise them up. Okay, but listen to me. When they see that, that's huge. My dad cares. My mom cares. You will remember. I, I know you don't think this now. You will remember your Sunday school teachers when you were a little kid. I remember Miss Betty. She was, she was, when I was like first or second grade, she had a red wig. And we knew it was a wig because sometimes it was crooked. But I remember her. This was, this was like... 25 years ago, and I remember, I remember her face, I remember that she always smelled like cough drops. I remember that she taught us about Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. I'm not, I'm definitely not saying that you should take your kids out of all sports. You should not go home and be like, well, Pastor, I'm leaving that church because Pastor Mark hates sports. No, I love sports. But I want you to know that I love Jesus more. Aim at that. What do we aim at? We aim at Jesus. He's the one. He's the beginning of knowledge. If we want wisdom, it's not going to be found in the pages of a magazine or on a Google search. It's going to be found in the pages of God's Word. Look at this. I'm going to end with this. Verse 1. I'm going to end with where we first started. Verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Solomon was a wise guy, right? Remember out of all the things that he could have asked the Lord for, he could have said, I want wealth. I want riches, I want power, I want victory over my enemies. What did he ask the Lord for? Wisdom and a heart.
heart to understand and govern his people. But look at this. Solomon was the wisest dad who ever lived. But a thousand years after him was coming a man who was going to take the prize for wisdom. Who was that? Jesus Christ. The wisest man bar none that has ever existed. So when it says the Proverbs of Solomon, you know what Solomon's name means? It means peace or peaceable or peaceful. It's just talking about the fact that David was a man of war and Solomon was a man of peace. But coming after him was a man who was called the Prince of Peace, who commands peace. Solomon is a shadow of a greater person. He, he was called here the son of David. Now, if you lived in ancient Israel, that was an incredible pedigree. That was like saying, I'm the president's son. I'm the king's son. I am, I'm the son of the most beloved man in Israel. Right? He was a son of a king. But Jesus Christ came a thousand years later, and he was called the son of David. He took the mantle of leadership of his people. All right? It also says here at the end of verse 1 that he was the king of Israel. It doesn't get better than that, right? King of a country. What a man. We should listen to him. But the truth is he was the king of a very temporary nation. Within one generation, his nation would be French. Jesus comes as king crowned over all of his creation. His kingdom will have no end. It will reign forever. Solomon may have wrote these words. He may have written these words. But Jesus Christ is the center. Solomon was looking forward to somebody that he was a shadow. Today, what are we aiming at? We aim at the person who worked with Jesus Christ. We don't want our kids to be moral. We want our kids to be saved. We want our kids to know Jesus is their Savior. Where are we now? That's up to you to determine. Somewhere on the scale, there's, there's room for growth. Where do we start? We start with the fear of the Lord. We start with the right perspective on who Jesus is in our family. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish here. I'm going to challenge you guys. Live your faith out at home. I was talking to one of our teenagers in one of our churches, not here, because you guys are the best. <coughs> the other churches were not so much. <laughs> talking to one of our teenagers, he was the son of one, of one of our deacons, and he came to me and he said, I have never heard my dad pray. That shocked me, because I've heard his dad pray in church. I've heard him pray all the time. So he came and said, I've never opened the Bible. I've never heard him pray. He's never prayed with me at night. He said, we pray sometimes around the, around the dinner table at meals, but it's my mom who always prays. Dads, <coughs> show your faith to your kids. Instill it in them. Pray with them. Moms, we're celebrating and honoring you today the sacrifices that you make. Sometimes moms set aside all their goals, all their personal dreams in order to raise kids, right? Listen, live your faith out at home. Open the Bible at home. Don't just, don't just be church Christians. Take your faith into your household. You have no idea what God is going to do with your family. You could have the next Billy Graham here. My dad spoke last, last week on missions, on being missionaries, on the need for mission, more missionaries. You have no idea. God might be calling your kids to go somewhere and share the gospel with people who have never heard of that panic of you. Not to Africa, but not to the Middle East, not to China. No, you want to tell your kids, seek Jesus above all, above all. Wherever he calls me, I will go. What he calls me to say, I'll say. I'll pay the cost, whatever it is. Live that life out with your, with your kids. Develop this game plan, this purposeful game plan. It's going to take us to the feet of Jesus. I'm going to ask our, our praise team to come forward. We have a short time of invitation. I want to tell you this, though, before we end. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right, then how are you going to pass anything on to kids? I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to be real straight with you. I'm not going to try to trick you theologically. I'm just going to give it to you straight. Are you saved? Have you been coming to church and it's just kind of a thing you do on Sundays? Or do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? That's the most important gift you can give your children. It's not time, it's not money, it's not any of those things. Jesus, give them Jesus. Do you have Jesus this morning? Do you know that you're saved? He says, when you, when you come to him, he says, come to me, anybody who's weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. When you come to him and you become one with him, he says, I will hold you in the palm of my hand and no one will snatch you out. Maybe you're dealing with some assurance issues this morning. Maybe you're thinking, I, 
I was saved when I was little, but I, I don't know now. I, I've lived my life. I don't, I don't know now. Well, the Bible says you, that you are, once you are saved, you are always saved. I would love to talk to you about this. During this time of invitation, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're struggling with, with issues of doubt, please come talk to me. I, I want to go in God's Word and settle that for you once and for all this morning. What, a, what an incredible gift that you could give to your wife or to your mother and to be saved on Mother's Day. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, the, the path is really clear. The Bible says that we are sinners separated from God because of our sin. But that God bridged the gap. And he came in in the person of Jesus, took your place, substituted for you in your place, died in your place, and now offers you forgiveness because he rose again in your place. If you don't know Jesus, come during this time of invitation. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for everybody here. Thank you for the mothers who represent life in this place. More importantly, Thank you for Jesus Christ who gave his life so that we could have eternal life. It's a big picture. It always comes back to you, Lord. If there's somebody in this room who is struggling with doubt or struggling with a lack of assurance, I pray this morning that they would come. And you, would, you would reassure them. You know, or if they're not saved, that you, would, that you would convict them and then redeem them this morning. I thank you for everybody here. We give you this time of invitation. May we respond in our hearts and our feet.